business, and um, our fall program is on World War II history. So um, I, I know some of you attended the last lecture, which was Vivian Gordon mm -hmm. on degenerate art and the Nazi yes, regime. Yes, yes. Okay, so, so we're continuing onward, and tonight we have with us um, Professor Jack Needle. Um, he's a retired professor of history. He worked at Brookdale Community College for over 30 years. He taught a wide range of courses, including recent American history, dimensions of the Holocaust, and history of World War II. Over the decades, he has been active um, with outreach, business, and community development at Brookdale Community College, founding the Center for Holocaust Studies, and now the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Education Center. With Dr. Siegler and Dean Norma Klein coordinating tour and talk, teaching in Elder Hostel, Elder Campus, and a number of non-credit courses. Uh, before coming to Brookdale, Jack taught at Red Bank High School, where he was social studies chair and director of secondary education. He was also active in Brookdale's Center for World War II Studies and Conflict Resolution. Jack received his AB at Northeastern University and his MA at Harvard University. He has received fellowships and scholarships to Princeton University, the University of Chicago, SUNY at Stony Brook, Jordan's University of Amman, Yad Vashem, Rutgers University, Adelphi University, and Eastern College. And tonight he will be speaking on the greatest theft uh, Nazi expropriation during and after World War II. So without further ado, I introduce to you Jack Needle. Good evening. Um, I saw that uh, you already had uh, one speaker on art. Yes. On and uh, Vivian's great. She gives one, one performance. Of, and I am seeing you're going to have Harry, Harry Ettinger coming in. So you'll hear another one about the the, so you've got sort of the woman in gold, and then you have the monuments men. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to give you the sad story. The American public, Jewish Americans in particular, are enthralled by good, popular, or feel-good popular movies, such as The Monument Men and Women in Gold. Top stars like George Clooney and Helen Mirren add to the glamour of scripts that emphasize victory by the victims over the Nazi theft some 70 years ago. What is lost in this myopic, buoyant view is the fact that the greatest theft in history basically succeeded. Uh, we'll take a look at both sides of the equation and, and see the results. Now also, uh, just this past week, you probably saw in the New York Times about the gold train in, in Poland, and suddenly they've got thousands of, of you know, gold hunters or treasure hunters, whatever they call, and they also have 150 media personnel there. So you can imagine how they're gonna overplay that. Uh, the, the odds are there's no gold there. When, when the Nazis shipped stuff out, they shipped it at the end of the war, towards the end of the war, and, and, and more uh, hurriedly because the, the Allies were coming, they shipped it back to Germany and to Austria, greater Germany. So the, the likelihood of anything in Poland, if, if there was anything, it was unfortunately taken by the Russians. They had their monuments group as well. To, to steal and bring stuff back to the Soviet Union to repay them for the damage the Nazis had done. And they had done vicious, vicious, uh, ter terrible destruction. Uh, about the Monuments Men, nothing can diminish the accomplishment they achieved. At the time of the Normandy invasion in June 1944, there were only a few dozen involved at that time. Eventually, only about 300 men and women were serving when the discoveries of the hidden treasure sites were found. And the treasure sites were over hundreds and hundreds of square miles of Germany and Austria. Uh, and they went from places like Neuschwanstein, the Disneyland castle that we all know, uh, outside of Munich, to the salt mines, and the salt mines had been worked from Roman times on so that they, they, 
They were huge. They, they were down below a, a half mile below ground. They went on for one was 35 miles long. They had uh, side tunnels on each side. And a lot of them were walled up with, you know, to hide some of the, uh, the loot that they had taken. Um, <clears throat> the United States set an international precedent to return stolen items to victim nations and to individuals. We'll, we'll talk more about the limited results, though. However little that the overall, in the overall picture about the monument men and women in gold, the achievement is still astonishing. And for the monument men, it was a world precedent. No nation had ever done anything like that, set up a, a commission to return stolen stuff that were considered to be you know, war booty, just uh, objects. Uh, in the example of uh, an individual seeking restitution, Helen Mirren's depiction of Maria Altman's struggle to regain uh, Gustav Klumpf's paintings of her aunt Adele is inspiring, but we must look closer at her situation, which enabled her to win this long shot case. These are examples of success in what, in what must be termed the greatest treasure hunt in history. But what I'm going to talk about is the greatest theft in history. As a background, we have to look at the Holocaust in general and see what was really stolen. What of the six million Jews and five million non-Jews who were murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators between 1935 and 1939 and 1945? These were civilians, non-combatants, not killed by warfare. What is a single life worth? Uh, there has been no recompense for them but this is not a lecture on morality or ethics. What we want to do is talk about the material treasure. Um, however, let's be clear on the near success of one Nazi goal. If you looked at the principles of the Nazi party, one third of them, of the 20 goals that were set, were all anti-Semitic goals. And they succeeded at that. Two thirds of European Jews were murdered one third of world Jewish population was decimated. The center of Jewish learning and living was nearly totally obliviated. Perhaps we neglect the impact of this destruction so many decades later because we concentrate on the creation of the state of Israel, the regrowth of the Jewish population, and the general success of Jews worldwide in the post-war uh, post-World War II era. But these Jews represent a great part of the greater theft in history. Um, Raoul Wall Wallenberg wrote a seminal book, uh, actually it's a multi-volume, called The Destruction of European Jews. And he writes, by 1943, most of the Jews were dead. So those of you who hold on to, well, if we bombed Auschwitz, we, would have saved mi we wouldn't have saved millions. At most, maybe half a million, which, of course, but even then, that's not sure. You probably would have saved maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000, all individual lives. But by 43, as Hilberg wrote, most were already dead. Now, here's where it ties into the greatest theft. They left behind them a legacy which was to occupy the bureaucrats, the Nazi bureaucrats, for months and years. Personal property, apartments, Jewish community property, blocked accounts, goods in custom houses, sequestered securities, firms in real estate still under trusteeship, credits and debts, pensions, insurance, and inheritance problems. All these odds and ends, unliquidated expropriations and unfinished business were dropped into the laps of the Nazi finance ministry's experts. And to ensure that it went to the, to the state, 
not to individual scavengers and so forth, special laws were passed. On November 25th, 1941, the 11th Ordinance to the Reich Citizenship Law was passed to ensure that only the Reich was to profit from the destruction of the Jews. So we fixate on the modest success of recovered treasury. Let's take a look at the estimated figures, however. Experts pretty much agree that the total value of expropriated art was valued at approximately $10 billion. In paintings alone, an estimated 100,000 works of art were outright stolen or forced into below value sale. In both cases, the authorities believe only 5% will ever be recovered. That means that of the $10 billion of stolen art assets, less than one billion will be recovered. And of the 100,000 paintings, about 5,000 will be recovered. Now let's look at those publicized paintings that were in the newspapers and on TV. Wealth and fame have been in, report, in reporting and reclaiming artwork. Paul Rosenberg was an eminent art dealer and a collector. Everything in his possession was cataloged, and most of the works were well known. With the family's wealth and prestige, they escaped from, from France, from Europe, it has taken three generations to regain 340 paintings of the approximately 400 works that were stolen. Now that, that is a significant number, only because they had the wealth to pursue it, he was well known, the paintings were well known, they were cataloged, and they were listed, so they could be reclaimed. Some works had to be repurchased, you had to bargain to get your own, your own property back. A family spokesman said that in order to get more back, it would take another generation. Quote, I think it might take our grandchildren to find them. Grandchildren. Five generations. And they can do that because they have the money and they have the, the knowledge of, of the, the, uh, the, you know, what is stolen, the item stolen. An El Greco painting was returned to the heirs of a Viennese industrialist because it was well known and on the list of looted art. Although almost recovered earlier, the painting had been sold, moved around for about 80 years before resurfacing in New York, and there it was claimed by uh, the heirs. Uh, and and they, they needed help from the Commission for Looted Art in Europe, which uh, discovered it. The Rothschild family is another example of these well-publicized restitutions. Some 3,500 treasures of the Rothschilds, including art, jewelry, and my daughter and I were talking about this, you know, jewelry will hardly ever be reclaimed. You know, think of Adele with that necklace on her. Was the necklace ever reclaimed? It'll never be reclaimed. Uh, and uh, other art objects. Uh, now, furniture is, if you go to any major museum, you have the, you know, sections for design and furniture and so forth. And the, the, when they bought them, they were valuable. Some of them were antiques, and a lot of that won't be, won't be reclaimed either. But the, the, because the, uh, the Rothschilds were well, well known, they were able to reclaim that when, when much of this material, all of their material was in one batch, taken from France, and was th thrown with other looted art in one of the salt mines in Austria. And when it was discovered by the monuments men, they were able to reclaim much of it. However, when they tried to bring it to the United States because they had emigrated to the United States, the Austrian government extorted 250 of them that they were Austrian treasures and had to be left behind. Uh, eventually, they got all of it back, however, 
because the Austrians got bad publicity on that. Uh, and much of that information is, uh, most of that information is gotten from the New York Times. I followed uh, religiously in the Times in the art sections. This was in 19, 19 uh, I'm sorry, 2013, 2013. Um, <clears throat> as for Maria Altman, the depiction of Maria in the film, The, the Woman in Gold, is that her finances were limited to a boutique and that her conditions were comfortable. Uh, did anyone think of her as rich, as wealthy? No. no. Uh, the more substantial story is that she and descendants had been awarded $21 million in 2005 as payment for a sugar refinery which was Aryanized after the Anschluss, uh, the uniting of uh, Germany and, and Austria for the Greater Reich. Um, and Aryanized means they were forced to sell at l the lowest prices possible. Uh, she thus had the money to pursue restitution of the family Klimst. She needed the determination, however, and that she had, and my daughter reminded me also her lawyer was very supportive. And he's the one that wrote the book on which the film is based upon. Finally, in 2006, she was awarded ownership of the five paintings. She gets them in 2006. Five years later, she dies at a ripe old age of 94, which raises another question about justice being done. None, or perhaps hardly none, of the original victims lived to see restitution. Delay and delay and delay was a conscious tactic used to defeat victims. This is by museums, by governments, by other institutions. Even descendants died before the cases were finalized. How many people live to the age of 95 and have the financial resources to fight complicated legal cases? And uh, I will go over one of the, you know, the documents that they had to go through. Further complicating restitution of the fact that art dealers and private collectors are not bound by the 1998 Washington Conference on Nazi Confiscated Art, although more than 40 countries signed it. Some 47 countries signed it, but the individual art collectors, dealers, don't have to go along with it. Um, this is, uh, again, an article uh, this year th in March from the Times. Uh, restitution tends to be the exception rather than the rule. A report issued this past September by the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany and the World Jewish Restitution Organization concluded that most countries have done little to live up to international agreements. And then it names the countries. And although Germany had been getting a lot of credit, they've been very, very cooperative. Um, you all know about the girl at cash, the, the stash that was, they, they found. And, uh, they, and the German government hid it for two years. They didn't report it for two years. And they knew that most of it was looted. In France, fewer than 100 of the 2,000 unclaimed works of looted art that hang in the country's museums have been returned. Only 100 of 2,000. They know it's looted art. Now, one of the problems is, of course, you, you have to go through who the owners were and so forth. You, you, have, to, you have to see uh, uh, how far back that goes. Um, and here's one that I was talking with my daughter, Marsha. In 2013, a Dutch panel, for example, ruled that despite evidence that a Jewish industrialist persecuted by the Nazis was forced to sell two old master paintings under duress, the ear's interest in restitution carries less weight than the interests of the museums that currently own it. 
now you have law, you have ethics, you have agreements, and you have possession. Most recovery attempts result in failure. In general, few successful claimants tend to have big bank rolls, meticulous records, and an exceptional run of luck. And what I added was uh, perseverance, as you saw in the film. In 2011, an online da database of more than one million pieces of property lost by Holocaust victims had been uploaded, financed by the Israeli government where the largest remnant of Holocaust survivors live. The website covered property confiscated, looted, or forcibly sold. All of this can be ignored by art dealers and private collectors. Only such public pressure and individual consciences can force decisions to cooperate. Even such prestigious institutions as international famous museums of fine arts have rather than surrender, negotiated with ears to purchase paintings that have hung in their galleries. And you saw that, that attempt by the Austrian government to get the, the Klimt's back from, uh, um, from the Altmans. The most conspicuous case of dealer collector is that of Hildebrand Gerlitt and his son Cornelius. About 1,400 works of art, including works by Matisse, Chagall, Renoir, Toulouse, Lautrec, Picasso, and many other renowned artists, were found in Cornelius's apartment during a routine tax investigation. It was then suspected that many of them were looted art. Yet the German government kept the discovery secret for two years. Ironically, much of this cash had been returned to, Ger to Hildebrand Gerlitt by the Monuments Men. A British contingent of the Monuments Men had found the art in a stalt mine. Gerlitt then put in a claim, and the British gave it to him in 1945. The irony of such an action is that Gerlitt was known to have been an art dealer for Adolf Hitler. And he publicly acknowledged that he had been accumulating art for Hitler's future museum in Linz. Not, uh, um, and I have here, uh, again, an article from this year, from May. Um, the cumbersome bureaucracy in Germany uh, hindered the return of uh, looted works, despite pledges by the government to right the wrongs of previous generations. The Germans have vowed to provide proactive clarification and a fair and just solution in keeping with Washington principles on Nazi confiscated art. Yet the lawyer for the Rosenberg family to get this uh, Matisse back combed through roughly 250,000 documents, letters, and photographs in the Rosenberg's family records. Chased down, had to chase down signatures of the rightful heirs and also of Gerlitz's descendants, and then had to negotiate with the government going down false. So you can imagine the cost of lawyers' fees. So you have to have a bankroll if you're going to pursue it. What news stories of restitution omit is the stories of the millions, not the well-known, not the you know, the aristocrats. The media continually concentrated on the stories of the wealthy and well-to-do, those who could afford expensive art and furniture and jewelry. At the height of its European occupation, Germany held 200 million people in its grasp. At the, the height of the invasion of, of uh, Russia and the fall of France, 200 million people. It enslaved millions. Because Germany was at greater and greater mobilization with more and more men going into the armed forces, the Nazis conscripted people from occupied territories to work their farms and factories. When not enough volunteered to work in Germany, roundups of civilians swelled the slave labor force. Now, uh, this is a, a newsletter. Some of you may get it. Uh, it's Martyrdom and Resistance from the Warsaw Ghetto Survivors. They have an organization that prints uh, this. 
and it, so the title is How the Nazis Helped German Companies Get Very Rich. What are these companies? Audi, during the war was known as the Auto Union, using 200, uh, I'm sorry, 20,000. 20,000 concentration camp inmates in this, in this. So there are differences. Concentration camp inmates and then people who were enforced into the labor. So uh, we'll have to go through. BMW <clears throat> admitted after decades of silence using slave labor, taking over Jewish firms, and doing business with the highest echelon of the Nazi party. The uh, Quant Arms Factories used 50,000 forced laborers. Forced laborers means those that were rounded up. Uh, women, children, as well as men. Poles were on to mention, and uh, they, they were rounded up. The French, they were rounded up. They weren't on to mention, but they were rounded up as well. All, every occupied country. They had a choice now with the 200 million. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, oh, okay. Uh, Daimler. 40,000 forced laborers. The electrical giant Bosch used 20,000 slaves, while steelmaker Tyson Krupp used a staggering 75,000. VW, the people's car, which morphed into the VW uh, built, uh, Beetle, employed 20,000 slaves. The chemical and pharmaceutical behemoths, BASF, Bayer, our own Bayer aspirin, which of course is American, taken over in world after World War I, but Bayer is German. And, and uh, Hext employed 80,000 slaves. IG Farben, at the height of use, uh, now they were working on synthetic rubber and oil in the concentration camps. They built a factory in Auschwitz and elsewhere, and they used slave labor there. Their most infamous product, Zyklon B. And at the height of uh, their slave labor usage, they had 83,000 people. Germany's uh, largest bank, Deutsche, uh, took part in Aryanizing. They took over Jewish-owned businesses. The uh, train builder and electrical engineer, Siemens, has not made any concessions of what they've done. Under a program organized by Fr uh, Fritz Saukel, who was hanged at Nuremberg for war crimes, over two million people were brought to Germany from conquered lands to work for the new master race. In the concentration camps, people were used uh, in the conjo conjoining factories, as we said before, Buna and elsewhere. Manpower jobs like quarrying and road building, even building the camps in which they were confined, were assigned to KZ, concentration camp inmates. If we took an estimate, a low estimate, of 10 million slaves and paid them 50 cents an hour for 12 hour days over four years, don't, let's not do six, let's, not do, let's do four because so many died and were replaced. The average expected lifespan of a concentration camp inmate was 90 days. And then they were replaced. Constant flow coming in. Uh, the cost of these labor services would be $9,984,000,000. Now, subtract to that because they had to feed these prisoners. So subtract 30 fennec a day for each one. I have no idea what a fennec was at that time, but let's give them, let's give the, the Germans uh, a credit of half a million dollars. So Germany made a profit of $9,983,000,000 on forced labor and theft of freedom. I believe the Germans offered three to five billion dollars for a remuneration fund. What no one has mentioned are costs for rehabilitation. Has anyone heard of rehabilitation costs? No. Now, I'm sure all of you know some survivors, I know of some. Now, the rehabilitation would be both mental and physical. 
Because of the American concern about post-traumatic stress disorder of our veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, belatedly Vietnam, we have a better understanding of the necessities of this post-stress medical help. Would not survivors undergoing the horrors and stress of the day-to-day -day living for years need some rehabilitation for depression and other psychological disorders? Yet I know of no survivor who was, with supply, uh, who was supplied with such help. How about the 100,000 hidden children? At a time of their first essential development as human beings, they were taken from their parents and families, were forced into fearful isolation, or had to adopt to a new identification. Some feared arrest or denunciation almost every waking moment. Shouldn't these have been compensated for a stolen childhood and a, knife, a life needing psychological readjustment? Now, most restitution agreements by collaborationist governments were in the 1900s when communism collapsed. And I'm speaking of such countries as the, that were Nazi allies, uh, Hungary, Romania, or occupied nations like Czechoslovakia, which were in the East. Now, these nations were eager to westernize and join NATO and the European Union after the fall of the Berlin Wall. These nations quickly agreed to restitution agreements. Naturally, get, get on the good side, go along with justice. But most of these agreements expired in 2003, 2004. They joined up or they tried to join up when the wall fell in 1998, and within four or five years, six years, it's all gone. There had been an attempt to energize restitution. The meeting of 47 states had taken place in Teratin, Teratinstadt, Czechoslovakia, also known as the Prague Declaration, uh, to recompense for seizures of property or other assets for sales and sales under duress. Lithuania was the only country to enact substantial legislation. In 2011, Lithuania agreed to pay $50 million over 10 years. The catch was, as in most formerly Nazi-occupied countries, reparations would go to indigenous Jewish communal properties, the properties in those countries. With few Jews left in these countries, Payment was minimal, as opposed to what the true value would have been if individuals, wherever they resided, were restituted. Again, doing lowball figures, if one took shtetl Jews, many in Poland and Russia, murdered immediately by the Einstein Gruppen, or forced from homes in Poland in concentration large, concentrated large ghettos, what happened to their homes, animals, land, possessions? If one saw Cloud Lundsman's Shoah, you witness Poles appropriating whatever the Jews left. Now, how many of you have been to Poland, Warsaw, and you may have taken a side trip to, we talked about, the, we, to Treblinka? There is a village that they take you to. It's called Tychochin. And a regular village, church one side, that's where the Christians lived, down the other end, a synagogue where the Jews lived. There are no Jews in Tychotson. They were all slaughtered, all murdered, a thousand yards away in the forest in a mass grave. But they take it to Tychotson, there's, there's a synagogue there. That's the restitution. It's designed beautifully, it's, it's re refurbished beautifully inside, and there's liturgical, soft liturgical music playing. For the tourists, for the tourist trade. Um, how many of you watched 60 Minutes this week? Yes, and you saw about Father yes, Patrick yes. Desbois. Yes. Father Tapper, Patrick. Now that story is, is from 2007. It, it, it must be re reprogrammed again or re rebroadcast. Yeah, yeah. And Father, Father Desbois, a Frenchman, um, went to the Ukraine because his father had been a POW in the Ukraine. 
So he went to the, the, the village where his father, father had been. And curiosity, he asked about, because he knew that there were several thousand Jews in the, in the community. And he asked about them. No one knew anything about him. And that piqued his interest and began his research. He has discovered over, this was in 2007, he discovered over 600 mass graves. The Ukraine had one and a half million Jews, almost all of them murdered immediately. Uh, the most infamous one, of course, is Bobby Yar, where some 30,000 were murdered in a matter of a week. Um, so at any rate, there were thousands of those little shtetls and communities throughout Europe where most of the Jews were murdered immediately. Uh, now, if you took an estimate of a piddling $100 value of such property and used just two million, one and a quarter million or one and a half million in the Ukraine, you throughout Poland and everywhere, if you used just two million, you would have a theft value of $200 million. If you increase that value by adding middle class Jews would probably have good furniture, homes or buildings, business sites, savings, etc., and you increase each family's value to $1,000, the total aggregate value would be $2 billion. In most of these cases, who would file the claims? They're all dead. Which brings us full circle. The tragic evidence is that Hitler and his hordes were very successful in two of their major goals, the genocide of the Jews of Europe and the robbery of their victims' wealth. The Nazis and their cohorts murdered two-thirds of Europe's Jews, destroyed its 1,000-year culture and center of learning, and evidently has left a seedbed of anti-Semitism throughout Europe, aided, of course, by time, politics, and prejudice, which has seen anti-Semitism grow by an astounding 40%. As for what started in the early 1930s as official theft from individuals and groups, this turned into theft from whole nations, the art, the libraries, the patrimony, the heritage of nations was, so, was stolen by the thousands of truck and railroad carloads and shipped to Greater Germany. It is estimated that 20% of Europe's art was looted by Hitler's minions, 20%. From time immemorial, victors, of course, would claim the spoils of war. The Romans paraded captives and their national icons as trophies. Napoleon enriched France and the Louvre with the treasures from conquered lands. The British took the statuary and the pediment of the Parthenon in Athens under the guise of protecting them. These so-called Elgin marbles reside in the British Museum, and the Greek government has been trying to reclaim them for more than a century. To prevent such despoilation of a, of a nation's cultural, religious, and artistic patrimony, an international coalition attempted to codify laws against such pillage. Article 56 of the Hague Convention of 1907 states, all seizure of destruction of or willful damage done to institutions of this character should be made the subject of legal proceedings. In 1954, a further convention was signed at The Hague to strengthen its force. Today, UNESCO, the UN agency responsible for culture, attempts mediation in such cases, with the more prominent cases usually ending up in court. Now, again, going back to news items, news articles, Just have to get this. The report by the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany and the World Jewish Restitution Organization measures the conduct of nearly 50 nations that endorsed 
landmark agreements, the Washington Principles and Terracine Declaration. Um, now, in, uh, uh, much of the art stolen from Jews during the Holocaust is still missing. In 1998, 44 countries agreed to the Washington Principles on, non -confiscate, on Nazi confiscated art. In 2009, delegates from 47 nations gathered in Prague in the Czech Republic renewed their commitment and endorsed the Terracin Declaration. For the last five years, it's been static. In several cases, private American museums have blocked restitution claims in court. Now, there have been some good things, and locally as well. So you may remember these articles from some years back. This is from the Asbury Park Press. Rutgers returns stolen art by Nazis in Holland in 1940. Uh, this is from 2011. And the story is of uh, Simon Goodman of Los Angeles, the, the grandson of a wealthy Dutch banker who had seen his art collection seized by the Nazis. And all he did was make a call, a telephone call, and he said, I believe you have a painting that belongs to my family. And they researched it. They looked into the provenance of the painting. It took them a year to do that, and they returned it. Now, the sad thing about it is that the original owners used these paintings to get out of Germany. The Nazis took the paintings and sent them to Auschwitz. Um, and this is, this is another one of the, this one is from the Star Ledger. Whoops, wrong, what did I do? Oh, here it is, down the bottom. That's from the Star Ledger. So there are good things that, that do, do happen. So although there are positive, uplifting stories from the tragedy of extreme theft and destruction during World War II, and there are many, that of the approximately 400 men and women who comprise the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives Division, the Monument Men, from 13 different nations who returned 5 million artistic and cultural items to nations, individual heirs, and families. There's the story of dog pursuers of justice, like Maria Altman, Simon Goodman, and others. That of legalists who established the Washington Principles and the Terracine Declaration. That of nations and institutions, and even individuals who have digitally re uh, researched the provenance of artworks and returned them to rightful heirs. But the devastating end story of the great theft in history, although it did not conclude in a victorious benefit to its Nazi perpetrators, was successful with 90% and more of its stolen treasures today undiscovered and unclaimed. Now, if you have any questions you want, I can try. The bee is looking at his watch. Hey, that's long enough. Uh, <laughs> I, I do have a couple of things. I didn't want to get into them, but not only did they steal stuff. Now, you had Vivian's... Um, lecture a couple of weeks ago and how great it was and so forth about degenerate art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a public burning, you know the, bur the book, burning. book burning? Well, there was a, a public burning of degenerate art at the Berlin Fire Department courtyard on March 30th, 1939, months before the war starts. 1,004 paintings and sculptures were destroyed. 3,825 watercolors, drawings, and prints were destroyed. Gone, totally wiped out. No, possibly no restitution. Now, as far as recovery is concerned, drawings, you have some here, drawings, lithographs, and other works on paper that were often stashed in drawers or cupboards rather than hung on walls 
rather than being able to be identified, totally gone. And you're talking about hundreds of thousands of these. Um, also, <laughs> unfortunately, American GIs bear some responsibility. Uh, they, they took souvenirs wherever they could pick them up. If they could carry them, they ended up in the United States. A painting you just rolled up. So there were paintings. Uh, Hitler's artwork was taken by a GI uh, who was looting, helping with his buddies. They were picking up souvenirs, actually looting uh, Hitler's uh, Bavarian castle. And he took them to the United States. The army got wind of that. It went to the army and eventually good people that we are, it was restored to Hitler's ears. So those are things that uh, could have gone into, but no questions, nothing. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, there are some things that are totally irretrievable. Uh, part of the uh, patrimony of the Jews in Europe were the synagogues. Now, there's no such thing as, you know, synagogue architecture. They're just different depending upon the region that they're built. And what has gone, destroyed totally, burnt down, with the wooden synagogues of Europe. And you can, you can get a book of them. They do have photographs of them and so forth. But they were totally irreplaceable. Well, thank you.